We will say it like it really is. With dignity and respect. Committed to free speech and common sense. Upbeat and entertaining. Straight talking and direct. We may agitate each other and you. Heartfelt and passionate. Thought-provoking, provocative and controversial. And fearless and truthful. Hello and welcome to The Pledge. And don't worry, I've, uh, I've got the cough sweets <laughs> just in case. Now, coming up on this week's programme, Afwa argues enough is enough. President Trump has got to crack down on guns. Carol thinks we're too quick to ban atrocities as terrorism. Nick wants to argue the independence referendum, referendum in Catalonia has repercussions far beyond Spain. And Michelle thinks we're forgetting our values. But first, it's me. This Conservative government is finished. Over. Dead meat. Broken. Sunk. Wrecked. They're not my words. They're the words of Matthew Paris, a former Tory MP and lifelong Conservative supporter. And he's not alone amongst Tories. It's quite obvious from this week's conference that the party has no effective leader, leaving Britain with the weakest Prime Minister, and therefore government, in my lifetime. Theresa May went from being hailed as the next Maggie Thatcher to the ridiculed Maybot during the election campaign, ending up a powerless prisoner being held hostage by her own party. Surely she either has to assert herself, and it's probably too late for that, or step down and let someone else have a go. But who could do it? Certainly not Boris. It's now obvious he's an opportunist clown, not a serious political player. Mind you, knowing the current Tory party, He'll probably get the job. If you'd said to me two days ago, I, mean, I, had, I had people at the conference who were telling me what was happening, they said it was grey and dull and, yes, the Tories were finished. Uh, and then this happened. And she's got a very bad cough and a cold, which I have, and which you've got a thing there. And she coughed and spluttered, and, yes, some idiot comic gave her a, a P45, and some letters dropped off a board. I felt desperately sorry for her. Now, I know politics is a, is, a, is, a, is a merciless business. I know that. But I think that while lots of politicians and commentators would be busy writing columns now, say she's finished on the back of that, it's a crisis too far, you're saying after this she should go and walk away, I think you'll find that probably lots of members of the public will feel greater sympathy for her now than they did before. I've just spent the morning on the radio talking to people, and, and they are much more sympathetic to what happened to her. They're also saying that for the first time ever up there, even in those circumstances, she showed, she gave more of herself than she ever has. She talked about, she talked about the diabetes, she talked about not being able to have kids, she talked about her ice maiden image and the fact that, that she knows that that's what people think about and she was going to try and change that. And I just think a lot of people will look at her. I thought she was dead me two days ago before she spoke. I'm not entirely sure she is now. And you said it on your intro there, who else is there? If there was someone ready to go, I can believe it's happening. I think she's going to get a lot of public sympathy over this. The media, and we're all, we're all laughing at it, and the media are penning columns as we speak, disastrous, worst speech ever. I don't actually think that's true. I think, I think it was a terrible speech, and I think it was very unfortunate for her. But I think the comic, I think the, the more serious question to be asked is how that comic got so close to the stage. He could have had a knife or a gun. I mean, no, that's he couldn't. The... No, I had to interrupt there, because I, I was at the conference, and I've read this and that is plain cobblers because to, well to get into the conference you have to go through yes. an airport style detector you do, so yeah. you, 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 you literally take your belts off so there's no way he could have had but he didn't have a ticket no, 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 uh, well he had a, a pass but let's let's come to the more substantive point about all of this um which is now of course great we now see why we heard the strong and stable line so continually because clearly the prime minister was a little hoarse <laughs> see what i did there um, <laughs> but having been having been at manchester can I tell you, I think until Boris managed to go down in yeah. flames after the day he gave the rallying speech, after he actually injected, and I've been going on and off to party conferences for, for, you know, since the 90s, and I have never been to anything. So, even when they've lost, there's been a better... They have had a collective nervous breakdown. They are flat on their back and they don't know which way to go. You had supposed heavy hitters, Philip Hammond, Home Secretary Amber Rudd, talking to virtually empty, uh, half empty houses. It was really depressing to be there. And then suddenly, Boris Johnson did what he says on the tin. He got hold and they were cheering and they had a great feeling about themselves. And what does he do? And underscore your point to prove you right. Within a couple of hours, he makes a, 
I think it was slightly overrated, but an inappropriate comment about clearing dead bodies from the streets of parts of Libya. So while there was that, there was a mood. You could see as they came out of... Shall, shall we think the unthinkable? Shall we do the unthinkable? Shall we, shall we actually move towards Boris? And I think you're right. I don't think they've got the confidence in Boris. Boris. And you are also right, Carol. There will be sympathy. So just lastly, and people will be... But it's not the people who are sympathetic out in the public who will decide her fate. It's the Conservative MPs, and they would sell their grandmother to hold on to power, and that's what's worrying But, Nick, them. isn't... I mean, I agree with Carol in some ways that, that I felt some wow. sympathy. I watched it and felt some sympathy, and I thought... Yeah, of course. It's bad luck to have yes. three... But, but sh in my lifetime, the people who have been, I know who have been successful had a combination of talent and luck. Yeah. Mm. I don't think she's got the luck. No. I mean, I, you know, she increased the Tory share of the vote in the election. How could she have known that the, yeah. the Labour vote was going to go from 30% to 40%? She, uh, she did this speech. I mean, everything that could go wrong in a speech went wrong, yep. which wasn't her fault. Well, there wasn't a plague of locusts. So no, there, wasn't, there wasn't a plague of locusts. Listen, I mean, I, I just, a reality check. Like, never mind the luck. These guys don't have the policies. They don't have the answers well, she, that voters want. I want to separate out two things, because about Theresa May's actual performance, I actually, I also feel sympathy for her. Mm. I think that British people actually like an underdog, and the problem with her conduct during the election was that she was the opposite of yeah. an underdog. She was arrogant and presumptuous, and I think that this does make her a bit more of a compelling character. And I also have to say, some of the commentary I've read since her speech has really played into me to this idea of female fragility, yes. which I completely reject. You yeah. know, she did. She she managed to overcome those odds. She got right she got through, through it. her speech. Yeah. I thought that was impressive. Much as I disagree with her politics, I thought that was impressive. And I don't think she's having some kind of nervous breakdown, as all these columnists are desperate to prove. However, if you look at the Labour conference, it wasn't because Labour are caught up in this kind of Maoist frenzy that it had so much energy. It's because they had policies that younger voters really relate to and nothing that she offered, you know, not the new council house building, not the measures on student fees, come anywhere close to giving young voters what they want. And that is the real problem Michelle, the Conservative Party. No speech will change that. Michelle. Well, I think, so if a general election happened tomorrow... I, I'm not sure who I would be able to vote for because um, I don't You'd like... vote for you again, wouldn't you? I'd, yeah, I'd be forced to stand again yeah. and vote for myself. Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, I would be politically homeless. Right? Well, I am politically homeless right now. I don't like the what I call quite hard left socialism of the Labour today. I don't, I don't like that. It doesn't resonate with me. And what I don't like about the Tories, I like their pro-business agenda. I like their... When she was talking yesterday about the British dream, one of the things I like about America is the American dream. Mm. I feel I could go to America and make something happen, and I like that. But she got it totally wrong, because what I dislike about the Tories, I don't feel that they understand and can connect to people that are struggling at the bottom. And not only do I think that they can't um, understand and, and relate to them, I think they make no effort to. Remember when Margaret Thatcher took over? When Margaret Thatcher took over, who wasn't, I was never a fan of, uh, as you can imagine, but she was, you know, the more you look at her history, her background, she was a very strong leader. I mean, you never see her do a speech. Like that. But, but Greg, do you not remember Thatcher in '81? They wrote her off. Oh, she was Two gone. years later, well, she, Falklands and well, she was, boom. Because she was. That's, that's what I'm saying about. She was a lucky. Boris, Boris is done now, isn't she? She was lucky. Boris, the, the, Boris I mean, has got to be done now. I just... Never. I mean, no, I never writes It just surprises me that never everyone's surprised that he said that about clearing bodies from Libya because he just continuously he says offences. I think that he is representing us on the world stage and, yes, it, it deeply troubles me that somebody... Do you think he should be yes, fired? Yes, I think he should have been fired a long time well, did ago. You see, I mean, did you, you, sorry. It's interesting to look at what the Europeans are saying. They're saying, we don't understand where this government's coming from on Yeah, but that's so unhelpful, because them saying that they want him fired is the best way of assuring him up. You've seen get him fired, but he's one of the few politicians that people connect with. You know, we've got Ruth Davidson there now who connects with young people. I know the Tories think that he is their answer to attracting young voters. I really don't know what that's based on. London, winning the mayoralty in London with a massive youth turnout. Yes, I know. I know they've gone since, but he captured the youth vote. But I think his record as London mayor was one thing. And I think you can afford to be a bit of a character, a bit of a buffoon. Yeah, they want to have it. London Yeah, wants but I don't think as foreign secretary that no. works. But he connects with people. How many politicians do we know by their first name alone? He does connect with every well, because class. he's almost like a caricature buffoon. Well, we all knew character. Ken, but you didn't feel the same way about <laughs> Ken, did you? We all know Diane, and no one found that very well, no, charming. There's lots of Dianes in politics. You can't, you can't just say. So you don't know who I'm talking about, Carol? But, well, because you, because so in you this context, yes, about, but not generally. Boris Boris connects with people, and he's young. Look at all the other guys. If He's not Boris is but young. he's younger, but he's younger than people. It's like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the party has to get through to the millennials who 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 have who credit to Labour. They've energised. He's he's their dad's age. 
Yeah, but look, but look what's on. Look at the thing. We've got Hammond. How old is Hammond? He look. It would have, what, doesn't matter how old he is. He looks old. But age, looks is, age is irrelevant. You can surround yourself with good people yeah, that can great. help yeah. you, okay. that can connect you. Into, <laughs> into great, the old. <laughs> All right. Before on we... a more somber note. This week, another ordinary American scene was turned into a war zone. The actions of one man, retired accountant Stephen Paddock, have cost the lives of 58 innocent people. More than 500 are wounded, some fighting for their lives. The world is rightly horrified. I wonder how many people know, however, that there have already been 273 mass shootings in America so far this year alone. Aside from the attack in Las Vegas, there were six other mass shootings in America just this week. Perhaps the only thing more inevitable than these truly horrific crimes is the ensuing debate about gun control. Whilst victims are grieving, America's increasingly powerful gun lobby is gearing up for a fresh war of its own. They tweet pictures of guns draped in the American flag. They claim, nonsensically in this case, that if more people were armed, things would be better. In Trump, they have a friend in the highest of places. And so the killing has continued. This time, it has to stop. I mean, logically, you're right, and yet none of us believe it'll happen, do we? Yeah. The truth is, there are 265 million guns in America. There's more guns than there are adults. Uh, whatever you do, those guns are going to be out there, they're still going to be there. If Obama couldn't change it, uh, who believed clearly, passionately, that there should be some restriction on, on being able to buy guns. How, Trump's not going to do it. It is not going to change. What we're going to happen is there'll be all protests of indignation and the rest of it, and it goes but away, and is... the news agenda moves on, and six months later there'll be another mass killing, and the same thing happens months, again. This, this is about the um, gun lobby, isn't it? Because even Trump, I have here one of my favourite pieces of bedtime reading, mm. Uh, the America We Deserve by Donald J. Trump. And uh, this is what he said about guns. I generally oppose gun control, but I support the ban on assault weapons, and I also support a slightly longer waiting period to purchase a gun. So even Trump, before this was written well, before he came into office, understood the argument for some measures of gun control. And now he's completely abandoned them. And I think that is a better example than Obama, who was always, always no, in favour of gun control, that, that, I mean, of how the written, gun lobby on, control hold on, hold on, politicians in America. That, that was written before Trump. And I'm not defending yes, Trump, yes, but I know. if ever, as Greg so rightly said, we go back to 2012 to the uh, yeah. Sandy Hook, 20 children yeah. aged six and seven, a few days before Christmas was shot. 20, if if ever it was, and I think Obama did try, and Greg's absolutely right, but what you don't know, and unfortunately as I lived there, it, it is, they see it as an unalienable right to carry yeah. a gun. Now, the fact that you, and I've said this to them, and I've actually been at dinner parties with rational sane people who says, well, of course I've got a gun in my, in my, in my wardrobe. I think you're a successful businessman. You work in Manhattan, you go home, you've got a gun, you're living in Westchester County, you're raving mad. You know, it's, and and the, the key here, which is what I want to show you, it is just the, the sort of gun that this man deployed. Now, you, you may know that these are semi-automatic rifles and it was made an automatic rifle. Let's just see the power and how rapidly they can discharge those, these rounds. This is why these things are not consistent and not preferred. I'm even going to put my right leg rearward to try to brace myself and you're still going to see my torso get pu pushed backwards. Again, only a total jackass would use one of these. And only jackasses in America because you say to them, hey, we don't have this in Britain, we don't have this in Europe, we don't have this in Australia, we don't have this in Europe. What is it? And they'll never let them go. You're right, but as great, they're never going to go. The thing is, though, I think, I think for, for us as outsiders, none of us are American. It is hard to understand totally. the mentality because it's so foreign to us. But at the same time, the but majority of Americans actually do not support... Mm -hmm. No, I don't, I don't, majority I don't agree Americans want gun control. control. I don't agree. It's not a majority not, who feel not, this way. That is, that is simply not true. No, and I'm not, not saying that the majority of Americans don't no, want in, guns. In Las I'm Vegas saying yesterday, they support gun lots of ordinary people were talked to and interviewed about guns, and they're, they're in the midst of this tragedy, and they, could, they, you know, they were still looking at the bloodstained streets. Every single person that, that was spoken to was asked if they had a gun. They all said yes. Do you want to give them up? No, because their argument That's is... if the good guy. No, but you're saying the majority of people want to give up. I'm talking about closing loopholes. 
not talking about. I'm talking about the fact you can buy a bomb terrorist. stock that turns a, a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. It's it's logically the, nonsensical, and and the majority of Americans it's part of their side. favour gun control. Explain, the bump stock is a thing you bolt on the back of this rifle, and then you don't have to open and reload it, and so it makes it an automatic rifle. But I, so I agree with you. I think that these gun controls should be. I don't think they should be guns in America. I think it's ridiculous. But it, to me, it's not hard to understand what's going on. I don't agree with people's perspectives that have this view, but I know a lot of Americans, um, and they are, as you describe, normal, my friends, decent, normal people. When you have a conversation with them about their views on guns, they feel so strongly about we are protecting ourselves and our families. That's why we have these guns. They're saying that actually, when you go to bed at night, you know, you want to feel safe, you want to protect your houses, your homes, the people in it. They feel so strongly that so many bad people have got guns and they want to defend themselves. What you're going to have now is if you tried to get rid of guns, if you said to everybody now, right, okay, gun, gun amnesty, everyone will give you a grand or whatever if you, if you hand your guns in, which is the kind of thing that should be happening, the good people are going to be saying, well, I'm not going to give mine up because all the baddies are still going to get theirs mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And obviously, I know it's different state to state in America, but there is no real reason for anybody to have a gun. And what I'd be looking at is going, right, okay, if it's too far, if it's too difficult to get rid of all guns, what can we do in terms of control? So even silly things like putting child you know, child safety locks or whatever on a gun to actually stop because you see Not so many, but you see so many kids picking up the guns and shooting other kids and stuff. Seven the whole thing is ridiculous. Let me show you a, a clip from someone from the National Rifle Association. The only way to stop a monster from killing our kids is to be personally involved and invested in a plan of absolute protection. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. It's hard to see how taking the Las Vegas killing, that makes any sense whatsoever. No, but it is, but it is the point Michelle is making. Yeah, it oh, is the point Michelle yeah, is making. Yeah, I want guns completely gone, but what I'm saying is when people yeah, are saying, oh, it makes no sense, why do they feel so strongly? I'm telling you from the people I've true. spoke to, they feel so strongly because they are saying, I want to protect myself and everybody. There was this case, and I might have got my dates wrong, it was something like 1997, there was these two guys that robbed a bank, right? And they had these guns that they'd converted into these automatic guns. They had something like two, 300 police that was trying to stop these two guys. They couldn't because the police were basically outpowered by these very, very powerful weapons. The police responded by basically increasing the power of their arsenal to stop that situation happening again. So this is the problem. You've got a gun. I'm going to make my gun more powerful than yours. You've got one gun. I'm going to make sure I've got two guns. This, this guy, this Stephen fellow that did this Vegas thing, God only knows what he was doing, because when you hear more about this story, the, the care and consideration he'd taken, he'd put cameras in the room, he'd apparently taken down smoke detectors, he'd set himself... There's something not quite right but, going but on. These, but these you stories, know? these are the ones that make the headlines, but, but what you, we don't hear is that seven children a day Anna. are dying in America. But have you noticed... And that mass killings are happening over, over this, time. this particular incident, and over lots of the gun in, incidents, there's not the kind of anger... If, this, if Stephen Paddock had had an Arab-sounding surname, America would have had a collective enemy. It would, it would, they, would, they would have had a go and they would have said, no, this is an attack on the heartland. If it had been a Mexican guy, uh, they would have said, you know, this is the wrong kind of Mexican we're letting in. But they're not, they're not going on about this because they know this is a problem of their own making. They can't solve it until they give up the guns. This, this, this will keep happening in America again and again, well, many more times than it happens knife. anywhere yeah. else. Because No, but, but you, can't kill, you can't kill 60 no, know, people but, with a knife. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but they know it's a problem of their own making, and yet still they want to keep the guns. And Nick's right. If Sandy Hook and 20 kids getting slaughtered mm. is not going to change the gun laws, I can't see what is. It's interesting, though, I think, the political reaction, that the idea that this isn't the time to talk about gun controls, which is basically yeah, what wrong. everyone said. What Trump said it. No, I, if a plane went down, nobody would say this isn't the time to talk about what went wrong, what, this but aviation but disaster. Because but of hang on, no, no politicians... They know. But, but politicians don't want to talk about gun control because they know nothing's going to happen. Yeah. Nothing will change. Yeah. I refuse to share all of your pessimism. I think yeah. I, I, I get the, so you the scale think of change. Get rid of these the guns? thing is, when you look at the, the statistics of, in America, how, how people actually feel, there is a very vocal, I know, an incredibly powerful, ultimately minority who support basically having no gun controls. And I think that. It's shocking how many of these mass killings there have been without anything yeah. changing. But I, I, there has got to be a critical mass where people say, our children dying, innocent people are dying, enough is enough. Well, I think more Americans have been killed by, uh, by their own hands 12, than have died 000, in the world wars. 12,000 people almost yeah, this year. dead this year. 24,000 people 
um, injured this year alone. They, they're not going to stop it, and it's tragic. OK, guys, we're, so we're going to carry on this discussion on Vegas. How did you feel when you heard the killer of 59 music fans in Las Vegas was a white man? Was there a part of you, like me, that was relieved? It's not terrorism, I thought. It's some deranged lunatic. Ah, I hear some of you say, but white men can be terrorists too. Yes, of course they can, but Stephen Paddock wasn't a terrorist. Terrorists kill in the name of some ideological vision. Paddock was a mad monster, a mass murderer, but he wasn't a terrorist. Whether we like it or not, the biggest terrorist threat of the 21st century is radical Islamism, and its followers tend not to be white. In the aftermath of Las Vegas, certain sections of the media have insisted we have to call Paddock a terrorist because apparently it's racist not to. What tosh. I don't know why he went on this murderous rampage, but I do know that every random mass shooting isn't terrorism. And to say that it is dilutes and detracts attention from the very real threat of jihad. Carol, I don't know where to start with what you're saying. Well, off you go, try. Um, so first of all, I appreciate your honesty that when you realise it was a white person, you, realize you also conclude it wasn't terrorism. Because I think that is how a lot of people feel. They link terrorism in their minds with a non-white person. That's my first issue, because there are uh, many terrorists who are white. We have neo-Nazi threats. We have Anders Breivik, who killed people in Norway based on a neo-Nazi ideology. We have Dylan Roof, who killed people in Charleston in the US. Tell um, me when this was. Based on a neo-Nazi uh, philosophy. Charleston was 2015, I believe. Yeah. Um, he killed people at a black church. But when a white person commits an offence, we automatically, as you admit you've done in this case, assume it's not terrorism. Now, I think we probably share the same definition of terrorism, right? Motivated by an ideological or political end. Yeah. The idea that brown people have a monopoly over that kind of offence... I said currently. ...is ridiculous. 21st century threat is That's what I said. That's not true, Carol. But it, but it is true. It's not it, true. So, so are you saying that there's an, and, an Andre Brevik every, every day somewhere in the world? Because there isn't. Because the biggest threat we, we currently face... And this is, this, is, this is the problem here. You know, that, this is, people don't want to talk about terrorism in relation to Islamism. They don't want to... People like you That's don't want true. to talk about it. You don't want to link Muslims. True. Every time we, we talk about this, we have to preface this by saying, well, of course, we're not talking about decent law-abiding Muslims. Of course we're not. We're talking about the ones that are radicalised and go around killing people. We shouldn't have to keep saying that. But what we can't do is not have the conversation the, because we're frightened to offend the people. The reason it's difficult to have the conversation is because of views like the one you're expressing, which is racialising terrorism. Now, listen, That's exactly what there are... There are Muslims who That's are terrorists. Exactly the problem. There are white people who are terrorists. On this occasion, I probably agree with you. That there's nothing I've seen that suggests that the killing of Vegas the was a terrorist. Well, what I find FBI interesting is that everybody assumed, before anything was known about his motive, that he was not a okay, terrorist. What I'm saying before is, we mass knew murder, anything, what I'm saying he was is being described murder, as a deranged individual. Mass murder isn't necessarily terrorist. The Yorkshire Ripper was a mass murderer. He wasn't a terrorist. You're... Charles Manson was a mass murderer. He wasn't a terrorist. Which... Dennis Nielsen was a mass murderer. We're not making he... any sense. So well, what, what do you mean I'm not making Because so I'm what, telling Carol? you, that we agree that terrorism has a definition. I'm saying mass being based murders on an ideological or political terrorism. agenda. Before you or anyone else, including Trump for that matter, knew what the motives of this killer were, they were saying he was not a terrorist, he was a deranged individual. They were saying Why? that on day one. They were, because, Why? Beca what Why the assumption? Because, 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 because they confiscated all his computers, well, they looked at his phone, uh, they looked at what contacts he had and they found nothing. Well, of course, I... Islamic State did claim it. Well, they always claim well, it. They claim it. As they claim everything. They claim everything. And at that stage, who, none of us were in a position to know. I mean, just didn't know. FBI said very early on. Yeah, after, uh, after that. But the Islamic State came out and said, you know, we radicalise this man. Well, as you say, they said that to every, every sort of... But the assumption term. was that but I'm not he wasn't sure radical. I, I understand the distinction, white. the difference you're okay. making. Well, Why? Well, OK, let, do you want to... This is the legal definition of terrorism. This, this is the, the, the UK one. Terrorism means the use or threat of action where the use of threat is designed to influence the government or an international governmental organisation. In the US, the definition of ter terrorism, a premed premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational... Groups but, or clandestine agents. But so what? Well, because, because my point about terrorism so is you have to have it. It's it, you're doing what you do in the name of a cult, of a belief, of a religion. Yes, but, 
Oh, but no knowledge. one disagrees with that. But the point is that you are judging so whether someone is a terrorist based on their race, not based on whether I they said, meet your I own said, definition. I said in Carol. the intro, and I was very clear about it, I said for a second, when I heard about it, I thought, thank God, it's not, it's because not. Because he's white. It's that's not what you said. followers of ISIS. No, that's not what you said. Yes, you said, I did. when I realised he was yes, a white yes. man, can someone back because, me up okay, here? Okay, so tell me you how many, said, when I realised he was a white man, I realised it wasn't a terrorist. Do you think there's a can you just accept my point that you did say, when I realised he was white, I realised he wasn't a terrorist? Oh, I mean, not when I realised he didn't have a political or ideological in, a, in another motive. part of your introduction, you said that some, age, some parts of the media are, are having to describe him as a terrorist, did you say that? No, as a racist. As, as They're a saying racist. the people who say that, that he's not a terrorist are racist. Please so please. if I say he's not a terrorist, I'm racist. You see, I haven't seen that argument. Because he's white. I haven't I have. seen Well, tell me where. So, so the, so the, so I've missed that. Give, well, me, no, well, give me a clip or something to show me where America. you said it. In, in, in the columnists, the papers say, are saying that, of course, he was a terrorist. Oh, columnists. And it's well, racist to say. What he do you wasn't. think, Michelle? I'm um, really See, I don't, I don't regard um, him as a terrorist. Um, I regard him as an absolute just... Well, actually, a that's psychopath. a little bit... Yeah, I was about He's to say. He, he is a psychopath, but also, as well, I stopped myself then, actually, because I'm just so confused at what motivated this person. I don't understand why he would go to all the effort that he went to, and he went to so much preparation. This was not just a random guy doing a random act. I've already described some of the prep that he did, and it's immense. And I'm confused as to why would you go to all that effort and prep and not explain your reasons exactly. why. So that because confuses exactly. me. Sorry, just briefly, there's a really fascinating article in the Times this week. His father, as you may or may yeah, not know, was on Robert. America's most wanted list. And he, the FBI diagnosed him as being psychopathic. Yeah, he never had... And apparently you can, ins I didn't know this, but you can inherit being a psychopath. But and then this is what they think you, and that, that means you kill people. You have absolute, letter, that's why they make such great bosses. They can do what they like, but, and they have no human your, emotion. This whole conversation is an example of what I'm talking about. So whenever somebody commits a horrific act, right? When it's a white person, we have this conversation where we humanise them, we inquire into no, their just, psych just, psychology. Just, 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 I'm not. No, I don't have any okay. problem with what you've so said. No, just no. let me finish. Are you trying to look at this? We don't do that if they've got brown skin. I'm saying if they're brown, they are radical. They are extremist. No, I need to call you on that. That and you know that has consequences. Because then but other Muslims, for example, are expected to, to apologise. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I need to correct your point because you. you've just said then you've just said if it's a white person, we humanise them, we analyse what's this, what's, mo what's the motive, who is this person, and then you've said that if they're brown, we don't. I don't, I don't agree with that okay. at all. If somebody's brown or white, you know, we always look into who is this person, what's gone wrong, what is their background, who knows this about them. So it's not true to say that With you only deeply investigate if it's a, if it's well, a white I person. I, I think, think when we think that, that it's terrorism, your argument, we, we immediately start looking at how they were radicalised. We don't look into um, their psychological state of mind, their relationship with their father. But Carol, the point I'm making about what you're saying, I don't, I've, nothing I've seen shows me he meets the definition okay. of a terrorist. But you assumed that before you knew anything about his motive yeah, based I, on his I, race. I, I, I said it in my intro. I was being honest yeah. about it. I said it. But and I applaud his, your honesty. But I think that's here's the some problem. tweets that say, Rihanna, a tweet from Rihanna, say, saying a prayer for all the victims and loved ones, also for the residents and visitors of Las Vegas. This was a horrific act of terror. Lady Gaga tweet, this is terrorism, plain and simple. Terror bears no race, no yeah, gender or religion. This is. But we're surely not basically this whole discussion on what Lady Gaga said. <laughs> well, I, tell, I was, I was, I was told Gaga. to read it out. I'm just, no, I'm just well, I'm telling you, that's that, if that's all they can find, then the whole premise yeah, of what you're arguing is My point is terrorism has to have a reason. You have to have... I agree. It has to be an ideology. It has to be a religion. Well, I will ask you again how you concluded that he wasn't a terrorist before you knew what his motive was. But can I just try and stick up for you a little bit? And Good. Probably, and probably get myself into a whole amount of trouble when I do. Um, <laughs> but... but to be fair to you, Carol, there is. If you said to anybody, you know, consciously, subconsciously or whatever, in your head, what is the current face, if you like, what, what is the, the current threat, the terrorist it threat that we face, a lot of people will say it's a young Muslim guy that's been radicalised and is acting under Islamist um, extremism for whatever gain, political, you know, cultural gain or whatever. That is what a lot of people will think and it's not racist to think that it's an accurate reflection exactly. of the facts and the statistics of what's going on. That is the narrative that we've created. It's so, not no, 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 stop. 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 Let, let me correct you. It's yeah. not the narrative. Let me correct you. I remember having a similar no, conversation. Stop. That's not the, it's not a narrative that that it's is the, the most recent flurry of terrorist attacks that have been committed by young Muslim Islamist extremists. And That's not a narrative. That is a fact. And it's happening all no, over no. the world. Do, hang on, well. stop. 
Do you accept that? I definitely accept that there is a problem right. with Islamic extremism. The point I'm making is when we have a, um, a white person who is an extremist, whether they're from a neo-Nazi background or whatever they've been radicalized into, we call it something else. And that obscures, therefore, the true extent to which... Should we not have a discussion about, about, discussion no, about I think it's great that we're having okay, a discussion, back, and I hope back, you're taking away from what I'm saying. But go back 20 years, and, I mean, the men who went to jail for the Birmingham pub bombing went to jail because they were Irish. Yes. They had, didn't do it. They were picked up. It was convenient to, to charge them. They charged them. They fixed there the evidence. When terrorism went to, so, so terrorism isn't all. It's just about what is who is likely to be blowing yes. you up at yes. this time. I, 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 I have to I be don't. radical team <laughs> now because I have to call it to an end. I'm up next, and I'll be arguing that the EU is proving itself e useless once again. At first sight, you'd be excused for thinking the criminal way in which Spanish authorities dealt with the Catalonian independence referendum is a matter merely for Madrid. But it's not. The scenes of police firing rubber bullets into a crowd of innocent civilians, beating them and dragging one woman out of a polling booth by her hair will have alarm bells ringing across the entire continent and could be part of derailing the whole European project. Paying lip service, EU officials issued weak appeals for calm. Yeah, right. That'll work. More than 800 people were injured by this state-sanctioned thuggery. But independence for Catalonia breaks one of the EU's most cherished principles. If Spain lost Catalonia, it's highly likely the Basque region would be next. Then would Belgium lose Flanders, France, Corsica, Italy, the Venice region, and Germany, Bavaria. As separatist movements across much of Europe watch events in Catalonia with great interest, Brussels looks on with nothing less than fear and loathing. I agree with you about the, um, the EU position, and, of course, it's in their interest to keep um, a united um, country. Um, I think that the EU should have been way more stronger in condemning what was going on um, from the police and the violence. And I know they've come out and said a couple of bits and pieces, but I don't think their response was strong enough. But um, as part of my research, actually, into this debate, I spoke to a couple of my friends, one of which, which, which lives in Barcelona, uh, just to get a feel for what it's like over there. And I'm quite interested by how what I'm seeing presented in the media and how that differs to what she's experiencing. And she is um, a lady, she describes herself as the silent majority. She's not in favour of independence, but so afraid to vocalise that. Um, uh, so, my personal perspective is that these people should be allowed a legal referendum. I think everyone has the, has the right to be able to express their desire for their country. I believe in democracy. So, I do believe that, actually, the Constitution should be amended. It all should be done properly to allow a proper, official, legal um, referendum mm. about the future of this country. That's the first thing. The second thing um, that my friend was uh, expressing to me is the amount of bullying that's the only word i can really put onto it really what she's experiencing just this torrid of information and pressure to vote for independence and you know there's talk at the moment that the that the leader of catalonia is just going to somehow declare independence over the next few days yeah. and she's terrified but, but how, but, how but, difficult but, is that how carol coming to you in a second let me just okay. uh, for, for, for viewers who just need an idea let's turn to a sky news report now by mark stone a peaceful sit-in by the, um, uh, the public here suddenly switched. They're, they're just firing. They're firing. OK, so this is what they're firing. This is what the, uh, the guy did. Just t tell me what you saw. I mean, they, they, they started uh, sh shooting these, these balls. They are uh, apparently just to be thrown to the floor, but they were throwing it to the heads. So I mean, they're crazy. Um, shocking scenes, by the way. Uh, Carol, to get this back on track, what do you think it means for the EU? I think this is the EU's worst nightmare. You know, their ethos is one state, one currency, one army. This is totally against them. And they're seeing this happening all over Europe. They're seeing people increasingly want their independence. They want to, they want to rule themselves. You know, they're, they're beginning to see that, you know, the EU, does this big faceless, unelected lump of people, they're beginning to see that they don't understand 
their individual history, their traditions, how they got there. And, and people want that back again. You know, there's been a resurgence of national, nationalism, mm. the good kind, where people actually want freedom and independence and, and, and the, the, the luxury of ruling themselves. I mean, and this must be terrifying for, for you because it, it was before it's happening. Belgium, uh, Flemish people yeah. want to yeah. separate. It's happening in France. Corsican people want to separate. This, they must be tearing the hair out here. And the thing that the EU hates more than anything is change and uncertainty. Okay. And this is all over Europe. Isn't it true that this homogenization when people are seeking independence, it, it's really alien to what most people well, would see? Well, you saw it with Scotland, didn't you? You saw the EU come out and say, basically take the side of, of the British government and say, if you leave as Scotland, there's no guarantee you get back in anywhere near the future. And I thought that was um, unnecessary that to say that. And that's the what they've said about Catalonia. But this is because they fear the breakup, though, mm. Greg. Yeah, but I, I think you're rather sort of dragging the EU into it. I think what was the most amazing thing about this was why would the Spanish government... I mean, this was going to be an unofficial referendum. Oh, absurd. Why would the Spanish government send in a thug police force yep. to it's drag bad. old, beat-up old ladies and God knows who else? And you yeah. just think, what did you do that for? You have turned it from being... Well, pretty irrelevant in some ways, yes. into being a big issue. And but then the king comes the king, in. King Felipe yeah. talks about the irresponsible... Can you imagine, God forbid, things kicked off in Glasgow. Do you honestly think the Queen would just come on an appeal for calm, not blame the recklessness of one but, party? Well, you remember during the Scottish referendum when, when there was an attempt to say the Queen was on one side or the yeah. other, oh, the went palace went yeah. mad and said, we are not, we are not political. But as for the king, I think he did himself a lot of damage. Terrible. Mm. And I think, I think the Spanish government have done themselves a lot of damage internationally. Yes. Afwa, just before I bring you in, I know you're a, a big fan of the EU. Can I just put it to you, <laughs> put it to you, that this great brotherhood and fraternity that they mentioned, and it's all wonderful and we're all going to be one great people and we all celebrate, and the European Commission, which is a sort of guardian of human rights for all European citizens, says absolutely nothing, as some citizens, Spanish citizens, are beaten with clubs by others. So that's how we do it in the EU. In the UK, as Grace just said, we have a debate, we have a referendum, it gets very heated, the people have their vote, and then both sides say, well done, you won, we lost, see you next time. Afwa. I think the scenes in, in Barcelona were horrific. I mean, to see Spanish police beating up fire officers, absolutely remarkable in Europe in 2017. Mm. I think the EU has handled it incredibly badly, and it's undermining its legitimacy. It claims to stand for rule of law, for respect for democracy, um, for dialogue and political solutions, and instead it's basically been silent. So is it threatened? So, yes, this I do think it threatens its, its legitimacy, ah. and, and, uh -huh. and I think somewhere. it's in denial, and Spain is in denial, and the EU is in denial, because, look, we know now that globalisation hardens local and national identities. That's what's happened here with Brexit. That's what's ha been happening in Scotland. That's what's happening in Corsica and in, in Basque and in Catalonia. You know, that is a phenomenon that's happening worldwide. And you cannot dig your head in the sand and just think if you send in the cavalry, it will go away. So I'm not Spanish. I don't have a vested interest in what's happening in Catalan. But I, I, I'm abhorred by images of force used against people who are trying to express themselves. And, and if you listen to the government of Catalonia, they've said, we have been trying to have a dialogue about this since 2010 we have not been listened yeah. to this has but been a last blame. resort for them the one thing well. there are parallels between uh, take away the violence the hideous violence take away that that didn't happen here but the thing that both of these referendums have in common is that the, the cultural and political elites of Spain and of this country completely showed complete disdain for the will yes. of the people the cultural elite, they, they, they wanted, they both, in both countries, to try to crush democracy and public spirit. In both countries, they, they, they have used that excuse, the, the, the reason that we didn't, we made the vote that we did here because we didn't have enough information. They've used exactly the same I, argument in Spain. I really want to bring Greg back in with due respect because you're the one person I think I haven't quite turned uh, yet on this. Let's <laughs> look and see what people have said. I, Guy, Guy Hofstadt condemns the violence okay. and then says, on the one hand, the separatist parties went forward with a so-called referendum that was forbidden by the Constitutional Court. The former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, has tweeted, what message does the Commission's implicit support of violence against peaceful crowds send to authoritarian governments in Hungary and Poland? I know I haven't uh, got you over yet, but uh, this is uh, a threat, uh, Greg. No, I think the EU should have shut up. They should. Yeah. I, there's not, they are not a political operation, uh, and, that, and they did say in one well, of their they early statements. They're no, operation. they're not a political operation in the terms oh, in the, of they mean other people's, other countries' politics. Other countries' so, so politics. Yeah, sorry, they yeah. should not get involved in other countries' politics. No, but they have. They, 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 have. they supposedly stand for a set of values, which is what well, being part of the European project. Well, what they did was they immediately threatened the Catalans that if you leave, you will be, you won't be in the European. Can I just let me read this? Well, that's what they said to the Scots. Yeah, that's exactly right. 
it, let, let me just read this. This, uh, this is what this is what has uh, been said. This is an internal matter for Spain that has to be dealt with in line with the constitutional order of Spain. It's a referendum. If if a referendum were to be organised in line with the Spanish constitution, it would mean that the territory leaving would find itself outside the European Union. This is the threat. Beyond the purely legal aspects of this matter, the Commission believes that these are times for unity and stability, not di divisiveness and fragmentation. That's getting involved. But, but before, they shouldn't get I mean, involved. I mean, I like the way Nick, you're trying to kind of cast me. As some kind of EU enthusiast who's mm, had to, had to um, betray the EU on you this. Are. No, I'm not an EU enthusiast. And I think it's interesting if you look at... Is this that for her? I, I, am someone else. I am a Remain enthusiast. That's not the same. I don't get out of bed in the morning doing a little EU dance. I bet you Listen, do. I'd love to watch I bet, it. I bet you've got a poster of Bianca on your wall. And everything. <laughs> Come on. Listen, let's, let's not visualise that, people. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I think it's interesting that a, an independent Catalan would want to be part of the EU. An independent Scotland would want to be part of yes. you that says something these countries still think there is a value in eu membership i don't think that these two things are irreconcilable well, national Catalan, identity how do you know can EU you want to remain within the eu how do we know that because it's they the because, region of because one of their grievances has been that the eu has said that they wouldn't necessarily be able to have membership if they were independent yeah, just but, but like who, who says they right. would be a member of the eu we don't know but they haven't rejected it so i, I don't, don't think nick can get away with saying this proves that the EU is a doomed... No, no. it seems and to me you're going to our own pledge, President. And President so it goes on and on. <laughs> anyway, stay tuned, because I'll be explaining why I think schools need to do more to promote British values, and I'll be playing a little game no. with my classmates. Oh. Ofsted has said that British values should be at the very heart of the school curriculum. Amanda Spielman pointed out that in the UK, some children are being brought up in an environment that is actively hostile to some of these values, and the education system has a vital role in teaching and upholding them. Amanda, I couldn't agree with you more. Schools should absolutely be teaching our kids British values, and while they're at it, they should also be teaching them stuff which will actually be useful to them in real life money management, emotional resilience, I could go on forever. With Brexit hopefully happening, it's a great time to look at what and how we teach our kids and how indeed we are preparing them for this brave new world. Define a British value. Oh, I can define a few of them, in fact, if you would like me to. And actually, before we do this, I've given you all <coughs> a small whiteboard. Yes. And before I tell you what I think British values are, I'm going to ask you to write one word that you think sums up British values. I'm going to give you... As prescribed by the government or but me, Nick you, Ferrari? You, as I mean, people, okay. you tell me oh, one our word... Our own. One yeah, yeah. word, yeah, word. Yeah, ten one seconds, please. Right, are we ready? This is mine. Oh. Hey. What, yours? Me and Nick. Oh. Do you know what? People, people talk about me and you, Nick, and we are so aligned. Oh, we're so Carol. Oh, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> we are. That's oh, the most and unlikely you, partnership in history. <laughs> and you and Carol are aligned as well. So, in yeah. answer to your question, what are British values? So, these are them as defined by Ofsted. Okay. We've got um, democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, mutual respect, and tolerance of those okay. with different faiths and beliefs. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, um, you say at the very heart, can I put it to you that as we are in a situation now where, and it has been addressed but it is still happening, we are falling down what are known as the PISA League tables, which are the global league attainment tables of how a country fares in key subjects such as maths and, and, uh, and writing and spelling and various others. And sadly, and it's not a fault of the teachers at all, I'm sure they're giving it a damn good shift, sadly we continue to fall with reading and arithmetic skills. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's far more important. These sort of things can come. I mean, emotional resilience. Money management might not be a bad idea because we're the country that teaches children nothing about money management and then plunges them in debt the minute they decide to go to university and then wonder why on earth they can't carry on. So once we start getting that right and we don't have a situation where a child comes out of a school, a young person comes out of school, 
and goes and works in a coffee shop or in a bar and actually can't work out change from a fiver for a round of drinks costing £4.25 without a computer or kill. That's what we need to address before emotional resilience or whatever it was. Well, be. so let me, let me come back to that. So first and foremost, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. So if I focus on just the British values, so of course you can be teaching people respect and all of those kind of things whilst you're teaching any other subject. They're not mutually exclusive. When I put in there things like emotional uh, resilience, I think that is incredibly important. How do you teach it? Well, in a variety of ways. So, for example, what I'm trying to prevent is at the moment you've got the so many mental prevent, health you issues. It? You've got so many mental health issues at the moment. And actually, if you taught children about how to be stronger, what are natural emotions, how you can deal with them, and you can, I'm not a teacher, thank the Lord These for the young people today. Up. These children can't add up. But they're not mutually yeah. exclusive. Yeah. Things, no, no, you're so old school, Nick. They're not. Yeah. And that's listen, why you love listen, me. <laughs> I completely agree with Michelle on this. Thank you, Afra. I think that it's not good enough to churn out children who perform well academically, although that is essential and we're not doing it, and that is something we need to work out where we're going yeah. wrong because we have these over-tested, stressed-out kids and we're still not performing well. But at the same time, none of us want children who aren't rounded beings, who can't That's cope your with job their as emotions. A parent. Yes, but there's something that we need to do as a society to send the message that well-being These is important. These poor teachers, what more no, do you want to have them do? We're not in the era of the stiff upper lip anymore. I agree. I, I, I agree. One. I agree that it's teachers are being asked to do a lot Too now. Too much. But I just, on the British values thing, I do have an issue with the whole British values debate. Not because I have any problem with our kids learning British values. I think it would be great. The reason I chose integrity as my value is because I think there's so much hypocrisy in the way we talk about British values. For example, we have a foreign secretary who has written openly racist articles and this week made a joke about clearing bodies from the street in Libya. Now, how can we teach children in schools about how to behave fairly and with tolerance and decency when our leaders behave like that? We're sending so many mixed messages. I, and the second issue I have with British values is racist. that I that's, can't that's help but fair. feeling it's something that we go and preach to kids, especially in Muslim schools, when actually I think we all as a nation and have some work to do on working out what we stand for. But, but wouldn't Stop. you agree, one, no, of our, one of our failures as a society, where we've had a large number of people coming from different cultures all around the world, is to actually explain what our culture is about. That's because we're confused and, and, ourselves. Yes, I think, we no, it is what we are, but, but, there, but we could quite quickly come up with the five or six things mm. that we say, this is what our culture yeah. is about. And I, I have no problem teaching that. I do disagree with you, Nick, though, about the breadth of the thing. I, one of the great problems of the, uh, that we're, we're making for ourselves is that we are incredibly successful in the creative industries, and yet we are ruling out all sorts of art subjects or making it much more difficult, and that's where they come from. That's what we need. And the idea that we only teach people, kids to, to read and write, I think, is completely... You've got to have that to move on. The, You've yeah, got to start. That's a core skill. The thing in schools, I, mean, I, I think there's no shame in teaching kids things that are quintessentially English, like the monarchy, like the church, like history. There was a piece in the papers last week saying that they're, they're going to stop teaching kids history. And you're looking at us like this is a really old-fashioned thing to teach. Why is it old-fashioned to teach kids about where this country has come from? I think it's crucially important to teach history. Well, I wish we talked more of it and in, more, and in a more honest way. No, I mean, oh, one of one my issues Here is we that we, we have a state policy of segregating children by faith. How does that... How well, is that compatible yeah. with This with is the woman who wanted you, to bring down Nelson's column. You're forgetting, you're forgetting the Trojan Horse scandal. Yeah. We didn't put those kids there. A lot no, of Muslims put their kids in those schools there and they were taught to hate Britons. They were taught... They were, they were given literature... Islamic literature that is banned in this country, and they were taught that, that boys and girls were segregated. We, the, we had nothing to do with that. They were schools run That's by Muslims for Muslims. You know there are Catholic schools that have similarly intolerant messages. To me, and if Jewish, you no, segregate Jewish, Jewish, Jewish schools, schools, and Jewish schools that have been founded schools. by... There were Catholic schools that teach boys that women are, are trash, Surely and that they, they just, they're, they're second-class citizens. Do we have schools like that? We Surely do. what do we, we should have done so? many years ago is do what they did in America, which say, we, you know, we are going to separate, basically state and the religion and your religion is irrelevant to the school and actually Tony Blair because he was a devout Catholic I'm afraid encouraged more uh, religious schools in this country and actually the Labour Party should have done exactly the opposite. And that's what I mean when I say I think we are confused about what our values are because we support but tolerance you as you've all said and then we a Catholic segregate. school to those schools that were involved in the Trojan Horse scandal. How can have you, you Have you looked into what some Catholic schools have been teaching, Carol? I went to a Catholic Maybe school. Maybe that's a debate. I'm a Catholic. And, and there are many Muslim the schools, only, there are know, many Muslim schools that thing, don't violate British the values The only as well. thing that we, they were taught about religion was the catechism. 
you know, who is God? Why did God make you? That was the We were not taught that other religions were bad. A, we were not taught that other races or people were a bad. A debate for another time. Uh, we've come to the end of that debate now, but we are playing a new game this week. Oh. Ready, everyone? Zero or hero. It's pretty self-explanatory, actually. The Prime Minister's thunder was stolen in her keynote conference speech, as we've all heard, when the comedian Simon Brodkin handed her a fake P45. And it wasn't the first time he'd pulled a public stunt at a big event. So, is he a hero or zero? Hilarious prankster or pathetic attention seeker? That's the one. I have a funny feeling I know <laughs> what you guys are going to say, but let's... Discuss it. Do you think that it was a it was a worthy oh prank? Lord, I th I'm going to destroy your game because whereas I thought it was very clever what he did with Seth Blatter, and I thought that really really worked, where he threw money at when Mr. Blatter was at the middle of a a, a a corruption scandal, which he denied. I thought that one worked. I thought this one was lame, and I think it missed. I think it so missed. So you're not the mark. against the prank in principle? No, I love the idea of a prank. The delivery was bad. I didn't think this one was very well executed. What do you think, Carol? I thought he was an idiot, and I thought he was an attention seeker, and I th and, and and I just, you know, he looked. I don't know whether he dressed to look like a, a silly little nerd of a man, but that's that's well, exactly. Dressed to look like a Tory. Greg, that's, uh, <laughs> that's I'm a bit, how we I'm a bit uh, friendlier to him than that. I I thought it. I thought she dealt with it rather well. Yes, yeah, she, did. she did. I thought she dealt with it really well. But I thought, I thought the interesting moment is when he goes back to Boris, mm. and oh, Boris right. doesn't know how to deal with it at all. In the end, goes, just, go, Michelle, away. just go away. Well, I just thought it was just a bit of a tool. I just think, <laughs> why you just? I just look at him and think, good grief. If that's the calibre of men, I'm going to stay single forever. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Okay, guys, we've got to move up. Show of hands. Hero or zero? Who thinks oh. he's a hero? No. Uh, even I, even oh, I he's got that. Zero, 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 zero. No, I'm going to You're on be. the fence. I'm in the middle. Indecisive yeah, till the end. Yeah. OK, uh, that's our zero of the week. And that is it for this week, a week in which the Chancellor branded Labour a political version of Jurassic Park. Innocent young people tiptoeing around, trying to avoid getting their heads bitten off by a group of angry dinosaurs. Ah, oh, forget the Labour Party, it sounds like the pledge. <laughs> if we manage to escape, we'll be back again next week. Until then, goodbye.